All right, I think I'm live. Hello, my name is Sashka Avanyan and welcome to Repat Armenia's uh, Repat Talks, stay at home with me. So I guess I'll just jump right into it. Um, so my name is Sashka Avanyan. I am a Repat, I've been living in Armenia for the last two years permanently, but I've been here for the last three years. Hi, Rima John. Okay, so uh, so yeah, so I've been in Armenia permanently for the last two years, and when I settled in Armenia permanently, I settled in the city of Volanzor in the north of Armenia. So that's uh, where I am right now. And about a year ago, when I came here, um, basically, well, that was two years ago, but just over a year ago, I started a, a social business called Creopia Productions. And together with my co-founder, Lucina, the kind of vision that we came together across was creating a very thriving creative atmosphere in Van Lanzor. So basically what that means is that the work that we do is video editing work and animation work for clients, mostly in the US speaking market. And then we also do trainings in uh, Van Lanzor for the youth here to learn creative skills. Obviously, because of the current situation and uh, the COVID virus spreading, all of those physical meetings are on hold, but we are continuing our trainings over Zoom, which has been quite a learning process. So as for a lot of people, this kind of unstable time has thrown a wrench in some of the work that we've um, been intending to do. And that also includes uh, movie screening events that we do, which are um, supposed to generate dialogue around a social issue that's happening in the film and then how it connects to the local context. But all of that is, of course, on hold. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about what the situation in Armenia is. We have over, I don't know, I forgot to check. EVN report is my, um, my main source of news for COVID. I just check that like once or twice a day. And then I try to stay away as much as possible from any other kind of Corona content. Um, but so yeah, in Armenia, we're currently in a state of emergency. Uh, and basically what that means for my daily life, at least, is that when I go outside, uh, usually that's either right now only the bank or the store or pharmacy, um, you have to have your passport with you and you have to have a little note uh, that has your information and your reason for being outside. Um, I walk my, I have a dog, so I do go outside every day to walk my dog twice which is really really nice because otherwise I would really be going stir crazy but here in Van Azor, the city is so lovely and it's one of the reasons that I fell in love with Van Azor, is that whatever direction you walk in from the center of the city within 10 or 15 minutes you're in a mountain or in a forest um, so yeah so every so most days I do manage to get um, like a lot of connection to nature and that is all thanks to my dog who is laying here very peacefully at my feet. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the mountains have been a very, very good comfort for me. And I'm very grateful that I'm not stuck in like a large city or in an apartment complex that um, didn't have access to nature because I'm really feeling for a lot of my friends who are stuck in those situations. Um, but until this kind of self-quarantine rule didn't come uh, into action, that was only two days ago. Before then, I mean, Volazon was kind of operating as usual. I have a really good view of a busy street outside my window and um, there was no decrease in activity until, until this rule was finally being enforced. So that's been interesting to see how people are kind of um, getting on board the self-quarantine train at different times, but thankfully I think it's pretty <laughs> consistent now. Um, so let's see, I'll talk about a little bit more about life in Van Azor. Um, I, uh, are they being strict in Van Azor? Uh, it's interesting. So two days ago when I went outside to the bank, it was first of all a very rainy day in Van Azor. Like the sky was completely gray. And something else that Van Azor is famous for is that we have 36 abandoned chemical factories that are kind of when you drive into the city and you can see them from the distance when you're in the center. So it was just such an apocalyptic view. I'll paint you the picture. So gray skies, factories like way in the background kind of muted. You have, you know, the gray city, not 
very many people on the street, but everybody that you do see on the street, half of them are police and they all have masks on and the other half are people, some of whom are being stopped. Um, I haven't been stopped, uh, but I can see people being stopped regularly. So it does seem like it's being enforced pretty strictly. And there are very, very few people that I can see outside. Um, I think I always don't get stopped because I'm always with my dog and mostly <laughs> Armenians don't like my dog. Um, but that works in my favor because I don't get stopped by police <laughs> during this time. So, so yeah, so that's the situation in Bolozo right now. But you can tell that like there are people who who are kind of getting outside more during the day, which you wouldn't usually see. So at least that's good. And then the other kind of interesting thing that has happened is that Vanazor is a city that has a lot of street dogs, not not unlike Yerevan. But um, since the these last two days, because I walk my dog, I'm very aware of all of the of all of the street dogs that are around. And in the last two days that there have been so much less people um, outside, uh, there have been like different street dogs <laughs> who have been coming and taking over like the center where it's usually overpopulated for them. I think they're coming in from the from the suburbs. So yeah, so there's a different dog ecosystem. So that's something else I can also comment on if that is of interest. Um, Typically, life in Valenzor, though, is very quiet. Valenzor has a has a stereotype and kind of reputation in Armenia of being a kind of rainy city, um, like with nothing happening. And now, especially with nobody on the streets, it, it feels especially um, like it's living up to its reputation. But I have obviously found a magic in Valenzor that hasn't ceased to... Um, to kind of keep me here, obviously. Um, and that magic, it comes from the mountains. It comes from the very, very kind people here. There's also a kind of stereotype here, the body Loretzi, um, which is just like a kind Miami Loretzi, naive um, person from Lordi. And, um, and those stereotypes hold true because people here are absolutely loving and so hospitable. And it's just a nice place to live. And even though I'm not from here and, um, Von Azor is kind of still a new character in my life. This is the place in my life that I felt the most comfortable and like I've been able to do the best work. Um, and so for that reason, I'm very grateful to have found this uh, this place. Uh, obviously, I came to Armenia um, through the program Birthright Armenia, um, which is a partner of Repat Armenians, of Repat Armenia. So through Birthright Armenia, um, I got sent to to Azor because otherwise I, I wouldn't have ended up here. My Armenian roots are actually from Artsakh, um, from the Hadrut region. So that's where my one Armenian grandfather is from. Um, but Azor is where I found my home. I'm a big fan of Artsakh, and I honestly would have considered moving there if it wasn't so far away from any larger cities. Vonazor is fantastically positioned right in the middle of Yerevan and uh, Tbilisi, so it's a it's a very similar distance to to, to travel to either large city. Um, that's also two large airports that are of great convenience. Not that they're of any use now, of course. Um, but I'm very grateful for where Bonazor is positioned and it's less than two hours to uh, to drive to Yerevan. So it's also a very good kind of opportunity to live in a more kind of relaxed atmosphere on a daily basis, but still have access to some bustling city life because that is also very needed for myself. Um, the friends that I've made here have been the best friends that I've ever made in my life. Um, Volodzorcis are very, very uh, creative and just like relaxed people. And those are qualities that I really, really appreciate. Most of my friends are some sort of artist, be it a painter or a theater director or actor, so on and so forth. But unfortunately, a lot of that creative talent leaves the city. Um, because there aren't really that many opportunities here to, to expand in an artistic sense. And so um, when I started spending a lot more time here, I was meeting a lot of people who were from Valazor, but no longer lived in Valazor. A lot of them live in Yerevan or, you know, outside of the country. Um, and the reason that they leave, of course, is because there's no opportunity. But um, the reason that Creopia was born was kind of because we noticed this trend. And so Valadzor is losing its most creative and talented people. But uh, with the growth of Creopia, what we hope to do and what my dream vision is, is to create a, a community strong enough that pr is able to provide jobs in the creative sphere that are attractive enough to those Valadzorcis that left and kind of started their careers abroad or in another city um, to come back and to, to have an opportunity to, to develop their skills and, uh, and grow their career here. 
So it's really a lovely feeling to know that the city has so much potential and every day that I walk around, I see it. And it's very, very exciting for me to, um, to be living in a place where I feel like there is so much room for improvement and to be part of the kind of very passionate group of people working here. And um, together with my partner, so my partner Lucina, she is from Valladolid, so so far more, f so our kind of love for Valladolid is very similar in strength, but very different in, in experience, obviously, because she was born and raised here, um, and I'm still getting to know Valladolid in a in a matter in a matter of speaking. But again, I have absolutely no perception or idea that I will return to Canada or to North America anytime soon. Um, I definitely foresee myself staying here. For for at least five to 10 years, simply because that's how long I foresee it will take for me to build Creopia into exactly what I want it to be and into the kind of, um, to have the impact and outreach within this community that I want. So, yeah. So basically when I came and this idea for the, um, for the for the company was born, um, it gave me all the more reason to stay and feel more connected to this place. And um, and I'm really happy that that happened. But it was a very slow process because I'll say the first year that I was in Armenia, I was just a volunteer. I was traveling around. I was living in different regions with host families, and so that was just the year of kind of getting to know Armenia. And that was the year that I felt very kind of welcomed with open arms into Armenia. Um, and then after the first year that I was here, the revolution happened and um, I had already moved to Armenia, but I was living in, in Yerevan in, in a birthright apartment. And so as the I was there for three months and within that duration of living for three months in Yerevan, every weekend without exception, I came to Valladolid to spend time with my friends. So at the end of the three months, um, the revolution happened and I actually moved to Valladolid right in the middle of the revolution uh, when the roads were, were shut down by, by everything that was happening. So I moved to Valladolid. I went back to Yerevan um, until the revolution was over. Um, I did a photo series of portraits of people during the revolution that, that you can see on my website if you're interested, which is avanyan.com. Um, so the revolution happened and then after it finished and Pashinyan was in power, um, I, I, I moved to, to Valladolid. And then for a year here, I had a job working for a company out of LA, which was really, um, really great experience because I got to know the population of Valladolid. Um, I had a team of 15 working for me at the time. And then when Creopia was born and then six months into Creopia's birth, I kind of left that job and I'm doing Creopia full time now. And uh, I'm very grateful to be able to do that and to be able to do that in Valladolid. It's definitely tricky. And um, there are a lot of uh, things that we're trying to figure out in the context of being a social business in Armenia. Um, but the learning process is fascinating. Um, so I'm very, very grateful compared to even my university days, which was, uh, I was in university before I came to Armenia. Um, like the level of learning that I have in my life now is probably 10, 10 times as much because not only am I kind of running a business, um, trying to get it off the ground, expanding impact. And I'm also in, in a still new culture for me where I'm learning the language. And so my brain is very, very stimulated on a regular basis and in the most positive way. And I've been sleeping, really, really well since I got here. And so somehow a lot of these different pieces of um, my personality and my life and my previous experiences came together very nicely in this formula that gave Valladolid to me as, as the place that I want to live. Um, I want to talk so, so yeah, so that's kind of the timeline. So May 1st, uh, which is, I guess, a month from now, will be exactly three years um, since I landed in Armenia. I landed in Armenia May 1st of 2000 and wow, was that 17? Yeah, 2017. Very crazy how time flies. Armenia definitely changed my perception. Nina John Badev. Oh, I love Nina. Nina was one of the first people that I met um, in Armenia because she worked at the, at the birthright office uh, at the time. So it's lovely to still be connected. Yeah, let's see, what else did I want to talk about? Um, so in this quarantine time, I, if you know me, you know that I'm a sufficiently social person and I really thrive off of um, social contact. Um, so this quarantine has been extremely, extremely difficult for me because there is no social contact. <laughs> and so I have been um, 
really kind of maneuvering, finding energy sources uh, so that I can stay productive and active um, during this time. Um, so I'm definitely feeling my time with a lot of habits. I've been doing a lot of daily habits, like the classic. I'm doing yoga, I'm doing meditation, I'm reading a lot. Um, oh, I'm actually reading a really great book right now. Is it here? Yeah, I've always, um, I've never really been connected to, to genocide literature because my Armenian family uh, are, actually aren't genocide survivors because we're from the East. Um, so this is one of the first books um, that I'm reading. This is Orhan's Inheritance. Um, it's a it's a love story during the during the genocide and it's very it's written very interestingly because it hops from like the 90s to 1915 and it goes back and forth in this timeline so I really recommend this book it's by Alin Ohanesyan. Um, my experience like as a diasporan um, I would say only started when I came to Armenia and started identifying as Armenian because I had no connection to diasporan culture um, when I was living in Russia or in Canada um, and so for me it's the the way that I connected with Armenia was very much through like a Russian path so when I came here I immediately had no language barrier with anybody because I can speak fluent Russian and I was very surprised when I came to Armenia because I thought that I was coming to this new exotic country that I kind of didn't know anything about and I was very excited to explore but when I arrived everything felt very very familiar and it's it's the Soviet Soviet leftover the influence of the Soviet Union that's left over and so um, for me, like my experience in getting to know my Armenian identity and developing my Armenian identity is very, very much connected with the ease of communication that I have in Russian. And so I'm not familiar with Western Armenian culture that much. I've been to Western Armenian restaurants, of course, and I'm a big, big fan of the food, but I didn't grow up in a Western Armenian culture. And so reading a book like this um, gives me a good insight into, into what that is, because it, it's a significant difference between Western and, Arme Western and Eastern Armenian, not only in language, but obviously in food and culture. And, and it's so amazing to be part of a culture that has such a wealth of diversity within our tiny, tiny culture, really, like comparatively to others. Um, such a diverse kind of experience that you can honestly endlessly get to know what it means to be an Armenian and how that and how diverse that answer becomes more and more each day you know, with our extended globalization, which has come so to the forefront with our little virus <laughs> that is showing us yet again how interconnected we all are and how dependent we are on things that are very, very far away from us and um, how that is both beautiful and scary at the same time. <laughs> um, so let's see, I'll talk a little bit about more about Creopia because um, Creopia is my baby and it's the one thing in my life that I've been most passionate about and that is all thanks to Von Azor and kind of my experience um, these last few years in Armenia. Um, so one really, really helpful uh, step in Creopia's kind of life cycle that happened last August was we went to the Sevan Startup Summit, um, which was an amazing week-long competition where you camp out on the beaches of Sevan with your little silo. Um, I made like some really, really beautiful friendships and connections from that experience. And I went representing Creopia, which at the time was only five months old. Um, and I wasn't at all giving uh, my full time to it at the time. Um, but we won in the in the social entrepreneurship track. And that's what kind of made the company feel real that there are all of these people that were really interested and supportive of the idea. And very, um, very positive reactions always came from the fact that, you know, we're doing something outside of Yerevan. And that's a huge, huge theme for Creopia as well is um, we believe very strongly in decentralization. Um, and so for us, uh, bringing kind of some creative energy, creative juice um, into Vaz was, uh, was really, really important and a big part of Every, everything that we do, um, because there is a lot of um, attention in Yerevan, which is fantastic. And Yerevan is such a thriving and exciting place to be right now because it's developing so, so, so fast. Um, and I really, really want to see a similar sense of development in Valladolid because the city has the potential and and and, and it'll happen. Like the, the wave is definitely building. Um, what else? So so then we also repat, so repat startup. Um, also put out a call, I think, around the same time. And so we're also a part of the Repat Startup um, Incubator. And that was really awesome because that's all diasporans who started businesses. So here in, in Volonto, there aren't that many uh, repatriates. There are some like from Russia. 
but there's definitely I wouldn't say that there's like a community of diasporans or repatriates that live in Valladolid but um, through the Repat startup program it was amazing to to have contact and know about what projects other diasporan Armenians are doing in Yerevan and outside of Yerevan and other regions of Armenia I'm always really really excited when anybody's doing something in Tavush as well that's where the province where Dilijan is which is also only 40 minutes from here um, I love living so close to Dilijan because Dilijan is very, very dreamy as well as a place. Um, and so, yeah, so Repat Startup was, uh, had been an amazing experience to get to know other diasporans and um, know that like there's really a wave of people who are interested and um, kind of reconnecting with the Armenian heritage and, and all that jazz. Um, for me, that, that step was obviously a huge one because I was completely disconnected and now my entire life kind of revolves around my Armenian identity. So so the path that you can get here is, is very, very different, but I don't know, I always tell people like, if you have any interest in Armenia, if you're diaspora or not, or, or not um, you know, come here because it's a fantastic place to be and I obviously highly, highly recommend it. <laughs> um, Let's see, I feel like I've been talking so much already, but it's only been 20 minutes. I want to, I wanted to cover some other topics, but um, I guess I'll talk a little bit, a bit, a bit more about um, my path uh, to getting here. Um, so I was born in, uh, I probably should have done this at the beginning, my apologies. <laughs> I was born in Houston, Texas, uh, in the States in 1999 which was not so long ago, objectively speaking. Um, so yeah, I'm 23 years old. Uh, I was born in Houston, but I never lived in the States. Uh, when I was two weeks old, we flew to Moscow, which was where my parents were living at the time. And I, I lived in Moscow until I was about 14 years old. And when I was 14, I moved to Canada. Um, and uh, when I came to Canada, it was a pretty seamless experience for me because I already spoke English because my mother's American. Um, and... Ooh, that's a great question. Uh, Zolvag asked if we have the opportunity to online shop in Van Uh So <laughs> shortly, no. <laughs> um, there may be there may be possibilities, but none that I'm aware of. And I just live in a very um, convenient place in terms of right across from me. There is a produce store and like a regular Hanut. Um, so there, I don't really, I don't, I don't personally do any online shopping here. There's also no menu AM. Um, so if you want any food delivered, um, there are only three options in the whole city. <laughs> number one is KFC. Number two is Tashut Pizza. And number three is this great restaurant called Madera. Um, but they are all shut down right now uh, because of the coronavirus. So there's nowhere, no restaurant that delivers food, but um but yeah, those would be the three options on a, on a regular time. I really do hope that as Bonazor kind of increases in size and activity, um, that we'll have some, some online delivery options because right now it's all over phone call. And then obviously exactly right now, do the shops have delivery there in general? Not that I know of. I know in Yerevan that there are a lot of people who are doing that. I know sauce delivers, um, but here, I mean, there must be, but I think that, I mean, in Valenzo, the culture is kind of so family oriented and most people live in their family with their families that it's always kind of um, somebody who takes care of that kind of stuff. But I'm not sure there there might be, but I haven't done the research because I haven't had the need for it. Um, but the other thing that I kind of came to, to mind as a thought about, um, you know, how Valenzuela is reacting to the coronavirus is that this is kind of a good place to be in terms of the fact that there's not that much movement um, to start with. <laughs> so pretty much everybody who lives um, in whatever neighborhood they live in, they have access, you know, within a five minute walk to any store. So there's no need to like come to the center for, for your supplies or anything like that. Um, and so I definitely feel comfortable being here during this time in terms of any other place that I would be. I'm very grateful that I wasn't stuck, you know, in, in a travel somewhere or in an airport um, because that would be kind of a space where I would experience the most anxiety. But Vanzor is um, a good place to be because, um, oh, we have trouble. That's not a good text. 
huh, playing this video. Rima, who is a fantastic um, team member of the Repat Armenia team uh, right now, has been such a great support um, through our Imagine Armenia trip to Kiev. Um, and I've also leaned on Repat Armenia a lot for all of my transitions um, as a repatriate. Um, and, uh, so in January, actually, I finally, after being here for as long as I have, I finally managed to apply for citizenship. Repat Armenia helped me out with all of my documents. Um, so Rima has always been helpful with that. So I'm very, very happy that I applied for citizenship. Finally, it was a very long story for me. This is actually a topic that I see a lot on the Repat Armenia page is problems that people have with applying for citizenship or any other kind of official documentation in Armenia. Um, my process was also very, very dragged out because uh, my birth I couldn't get my birth certificate translated here without something called an apostille. Um, so once I went through that process, everything went smoothly. Um, I actually had a very, very funny Oviedo experience with me. I took my local friend with me to help me with all the translations because my Armenian is still extremely weak. Um, and uh, it was like a four hour long process. And there were a lot of angry men <laughs> trying to cut in the line and lots of drama went down that day at Oviedo. I think it was an active one. Um, but and, and I was the last person to get my documents in um, because of the line we were standing in. I got my documents in and I was told that somewhere around July I'll get a call or a text um, with the announcement that I'm an Armenian citizen, which will be fantastic. I will be very, very, very happy that day and celebrating for sure. Um, yeah, it's fascinating to me how just three years ago, well, four years ago, I guess, I barely knew where Armenia was on the map and now I couldn't be more excited about getting citizenship. I mean, I'm supposed to get it in July, but I assume that that is going to be delayed because I know that the Oviedo offices, um, which is the, the passport and um, official documentation offices in Yerevan, I know that they're shut down right now for the coronavirus. Um, so hopefully that doesn't delay, but I assume that it will delay, delay any, anything that I do. All right, let's see. Oh, I didn't scroll. Barev David John, Vonses, good to see you here. Um, so in terms of the shutdown, kind of in my immediate circle of friends, I have a lot of people that work um, in the tourism industry. So especially there's a village north of uh, Vanazor called, called Debet, which is where the, the co-op kid center is. A lot of you probably know about it. Um, so there are two really awesome projects other than co-op uh, going on in Debet. One is this um, Debet Lifehouse um, that has been being built for the last um for the last year now by an Armenian woman who's repatriated back from Germany. So that project is amazing. I was filming there the other month um, and how that house is coming together is fantastic. And I'm so excited that a place like Debit Life is, is existing in, in Lori and in, in Debit. And then um, actually from my birthright Armenia days, we had community service projects in Debit. So I got to know a lot of people from the town during that time, which was my first six months in Armenia. And my friend left over from that time, Araik, he's building like a, um, a ranch, like a, like these houses and like a rancho for, um, Oh yeah, Thamarjan, the, the debit life thing is like a co-working space. So it's it's geared towards travelers who are location independent workers and who want like a beautiful place and a new experience in Armenia to, to travel to and, and to work. Um, and I think they'll also have camping opportunities there. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of fun development going on. Um, and in addition to Arayik's Rancho project in Debet and in all of that rural area. And so, so now um, everything that they've been prepping for for the summer season, you know, to make money to make back the money that they've invested this whole year um that's obviously all at a standstill so kind of in my immediate circle the 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 situation that kind of seems the worst is the hit that the tourism industry is going to take because i know last year in armenia that tourism was kind of one of the largest reasons for um the increase in our gdp um and so the projections for that have been have been you know increasing over the next years but that's gonna take a turn this this month but um but there's still a lot to look forward to and there are also plans in lori to build um a hotel um so so yeah so there's a lot of new opportunities oh somebody from Vonadzor. 
Hi, Bella John. Very nice to meet you. Um, tell me more about your project and your needs. Ah, fantastic. Okay, so um, so the company that I'm that I co-founded uh, is called Creopia Productions, and our goal is to create a, a thriving creative atmosphere in in Vanador. So that means job creation, that means community creation, and kind of creating a culture around uh, watching films. Um, so right now, because everything's at a standstill, my personal uh, str uh, biggest struggle right now is figuring out how we're going to move our online course, uh, how we're going to teach in an online format. So in collaboration with the Bonadol Technological Center with BTC, we started training 15 students in video editing using the computers um, at BTC because you do need sufficient computers to, to run the program. And so right now, um, <laughs> it's been a it's been a difficult process to get um, first of all the program on everybody's computer because everybody every one of our students has a different version of Windows or a Mac and so they each need a different um, level of Premiere so it's been very difficult to get that up and running just so that we can all get on a Zoom call so I can continue training um, so I don't know if you know uh, anything about online training and especially for video editing it's just such a thing that is is definitely teachable online like it's not not doable but i'm such an on on hands like in person kind of sharing my energy type of teacher that it's very very difficult for me to transition into the into the online space so now once we get like our technical chunks figured out um i'm really going to be just uh figuring out as i go as we teach online um obviously i still have the same curriculum and all that it's basically an intensive course on how to use premiere pro um adobe premiere Pro. And the goal of the course is to have all of our students basically get a basic uh, foundation knowledge of Premiere Pro such that they can actually do projects. So um, simple video editing projects in terms of adding text. And then we're also going to be training them on how to get online clientele. Um, so be that through Hubwork or uh, through Upwork or Hubstaff and um, these different platforms. Uh, the goal of the course is to kind of empower youth to be able to use creative creative skills as a, as a revenue source, be it their primary revenue source or an alternate revenue source for them. So obviously creative education is a way to do that. Um, the reason that uh, Creopia was also born was because there's there is no creative education in Bonazor. So if any young person wants to learn something here, um, they have to go um, outside of the city or teach themselves. So somehow Tumo overlooked Bonazor. There's a Tumo in uh, Dilijan, which is 40 minutes from here, and but it's very small and it's really only for the kids in Dilijan. And um, you know there's the Tumo in Yerevan and in Gyumri. So Bonazor is kind of in between all of those cities and Bonzo has a huge population of, of young people who, who also need to learn creative skills. So my hope is also to, to be able to grow Cre Creopia's education program to, to kind of fulfill this, this gap because um, there's a there's an amazing obviously tendency for having a lot of um, uh, coding training. So the Technological Center of BTC, which is where we were running our courses, they give a lot of um, coding training. So a lot of software engineering and things like that. Um, but in terms of the creative skills, that is slightly uh, on the back burner. So, so yeah, so that's another reason that that Creopia was born. Uh, thank you so much for your for your comment, Bella John. It's so lovely to know that there is somebody else out there who loves Malanzod. Um, I am a very uh, biased when it comes to to different people from Armenia, and especially when I'm outside of Malanzod and I meet an Armenian, I always I always ask where they're from and if they're from Malanzod. There's a lot of joy that overtakes me <laughs> because this city has done so so much for me and um and so i have much love for anybody from here or for anybody else who who loves bon Azor as well so yeah thank you very much for that um so during quarantine something else uh that i've been filling my time with is obviously learning armenian but i'm kind of a very lazy armenian student for several reasons the most primary one being that i speak russian so i don't actually feel um, a language barrier uh, when I'm here, but my desire and kind of more sentimental attachment to Armenian, uh, you know, is very strong, and so I do want to learn Armenian. But I, I've completely slacked over the, these uh, these last few years uh, because I took language classes for the first five months that I was in Armenia that were provided to me by um, Repat Armenia. But now, since there's more time, I am returning to it, but I can't really go back to my test book because it's not fun. So what I found was so basically what I do now is I rewrite 
Armenian uh, stories. So right now I'm rewriting Tumanyan. Um, now, before I found the Tumanyan um, uh, like online resource, there's a, there's a, there's a website that has all of his stories on there. I was writing from this one random uh, textbook that I found, which is I don't I don't know what this means. I've asked a few people, but I think it's some sort of Soviet geometry textbook. Anyway, so point being that my Armenian practice these days is me opening this textbook or um, going on the Tumanyan website, and I literally just copy and I practice writing in Armenian. It's not the fastest way to learn Armenian, obviously, but it's good practice for me to not forget my letters. And also, obviously, I like start recognizing words and understanding, but I don't understand anything in this geometry textbook, which is why I moved over to Tumanyan's um, short stories. So that is also something I've been really... Um, trying to spend a bit more time on because my other problem with learning Armenian um, and my other crutch that I use is that I can I can speak Armenian like kind of on a on a very basic level and I can express most of my thoughts but um, the reason that I can do that is because anytime I'm speaking Armenian here and I don't know a word that I want to say I can just say it in Russian and 99 percent of the time people will, will understand what I'm saying and so what my Armenian kind of sounds like right now is a very weird Armenian Russian kind of remix um, but this is problematic when speaking to Western Armenians because Western Armenians have no Russian knowledge and there's often uh, really funny experiences where some of my other friends who are diasporans and repatriates that are very fluent in Western Armenian but when they come here um, especially when it comes to things like household items or kitchen items or anything to do with renovations there's a lot of Russian words that are used so Sometimes that's an area where I can help out because of the Russian, but then when I try speaking Armenian to my Western Armenian friends, the language barrier is much, much stronger. Next to BTC. Oh, okay. You know, I've heard those rumors too, but there's, uh, sorry, I'm reacting to a comment um, that Bella wrote that there was supposed to be a TUMO center right next to BTC um, that was supposed to, to happen in Wollensville. And I had heard rumors of that, but there's definitely been no no action of it um, recently. But it's okay because now Creopia exists. <laughs> um, so yeah, so let's see, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, Armenian language. So yeah, that's also something I'm very excited about getting Armenian citizenship because that will make me feel more Armenian, but I will never feel fully sincere in kind of presenting myself as Armenian until I speak the language fluently. So I'm very excited for that day. I'm grateful for this extra time, a little bit in quarantine to be able to spend more time on my Armenian studies. Um, and hopefully in my five to 10 year timeline for which I predict I will stay in Armenia by the end of those five to 10 years, um, I will have mastered, well, my goal isn't to master the Armenian language because that will be very, very difficult, but my goal is to be able to, to just communicate freely. And one test that I will always use for my Armenian language will be improvisation because I improvise a lot um, in English and Russian. And as soon as I'll be able to improvise in Armenian, and I'll be I'll be very content with my language skills. But then the other the other point about being Armenian is that right now I'm learning um, like I guess a Vonadzorzi dialect, which is not very different from the Yerevan dialect. But basically, I'm learning Eastern Armenian. But um, it would also be of great interest for me to know Karabakhti, Artsakhti Armenian. So that's also completely different um, now when I listen to Karabakhti Armenian. I don't understand it at all. The only thing that saves me is that they do use significantly more Russian words than than Yerevansi Armenian. And then I would love to learn um, Western Armenian because um, the it's so so much more melodic and and less gruff, I would say, than than Eastern Armenian. But um, it's far less familiar to me. So anyway, point being that I'm slowly but surely trying to improve my skills in Armenian. But even when I get to a point I'll be happy with, I will still really want to venture out into into other dialects. Um, I actually I lived for three years, uh, not three years, sorry. <laughs> I lived for three months um, in Artsakh. Uh, at the time, I was uh, volunteering for the Halo Trust, which if you don't know what the Halo Trust is. They're, uh, uh, they do demining. So all of the mines that were left over from the war, um, all of the plans that were left, uh, all of the mines that were left over from the war are basically um, 
uh, kind of still a still a threat to danger, uh, not a threat to danger, a threat to life. Um, so I volunteered for them for three months, and we did a few small documentaries about the work that was ongoing in Halo Trust. And again, my experience in Arsakh was um, that all my all of my communication was in Russian, and that was extremely comfortable. I barely met anybody who doesn't speak Russian, um, and so. Yeah, I'll, I definitely want to return to Artsakh and do some more projects there. I want to kind of familiarize myself more with the village that my grandfather is from. And so Artsakh remains a very, very top priority for kind of um, exploration. And and I definitely uh, think that if Creopia grows, you know, to what I want it to be in Valhazor, then Artsakh will definitely be a, uh, a second kind of test area where I would want to test the Creopia hypothesis. Uh, hi, Robert John. Do you, he has a question. Do you have plans? in case Tumo does launch their branch, do you think it would impact their project? Um, yes, I think it would be fantastic if Tumo came to Valnadzor. There are so, 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 so many young people here who want to learn creative things. And Tumo coming to, to Valnadzor, I think, would only bring more of the attention and more of the kind of creative energy that I think this city needs so much. By no means do I envision Creopia being the only way that Valnadzor's creative economy will thrive. And so... I think it would be fantastic if Tumo came because it would be just another excuse to, to expose um, Valnadzor's creativity and talent that does lie here. And I would be beyond happy if Tumo came and uh, obviously we would collaborate. Um, I have a really, really lovely relationship with Tumo because when I was a volunteer, I volunteered um, at Tumo in Dijon where I talk, taught a uh, workshop on documentary filmmaking and everybody at the Tumo team is so fantastic. And and their vision for kind of a creatively thriving Armenia is, is very much in line with, with what Creopia envisions and as is striving for. Thought the Vaslan Young bought is this. Good luck. Thank you so much. Yeah, so so just commenting on this uh, this Western and Eastern Armenian difference, um, it's so so interesting to me. I remember one of the first months that I was in uh, in Armenia, the kind of first circle of people that I was getting to know was the other birthright volunteers, and so that was a lot of diasporans from the states and uh, from Europe who all grew up in their family speaking Western Armenian, and so when they come to Armenia, there there is this expectation that they were at least assumption, I, would, I guess, that you'll be able to communicate freely. And so what was really interesting was that when we would, you know, go out for lunch somewhere or in a restaurant, what ended up happening was that I would be the default communicator with the waiter or whoever we were interacting with in Russian, because it was easier for the local Armenians to communicate with me in Russian than for them to communicate in Western Armenian. And and so, yeah, so I figured that little, little difference on, uh, difference, I figured that difference out early on. Um, and and it's and it's eternally fascinating to me and it's so funny so i have a lot of um lebanese armenian friends and the lebanese armenian dialect is completely something else first of all lebanese people speak very very quickly um which which i have no complaints about i love people who speak quickly if it's not clear i'm a very fast talker as well <laughs> um but uh lebanese armenians when they speak first of all their dialect is different and the speed of it just makes it seem like a completely foreign language to me maybe i'll catch one word here or there but lebanese armenian is something that is of great Great, great difficulty. Weirdly, I understand like Parskahais a little bit better, Iranian Armenians. I don't know why, because that's also a very different dialect. But, but yeah. So, so I could keep talking forever about the Armenian um, dialect, and and then also, well, I do have some Armenian relatives, um, and so obviously all of my Armenian relatives are are from Artsakh, and so so their dialect is different as well. And I think that. For me, probably from the stage of Armenian that I have now, it would probably be easiest, but I'm not sure, to learn the Artsakhtik dialect um, because of the, the Russian influence. But in Artsakh, they have a lot of uh, like Arabic influence as well. Um, but anyway, yeah, so the language thing is something that's going to be evolving for sure. And I definitely, you know, when I think about the future, I think it would be of great importance to me to have my kids speak Armenian. And so if I want that to happen, obviously, I think I would need to speak Armenian. <laughs> so so there's a lot of motivation around the Armenian language on a kind of personal level, but not so much push from my daily life um, to learn Armenian. Um, so, yeah. What else can I say? Dun, dun, dun. The current situation in Armenia. Um, yeah, one other thing I, I really want to mention is that uh, 
so actually today I have a um, Skype call that uh, or a Zoom call with all of the birthright volunteers that I came to Volunteer with at the beginning. And it's been so amazing for me to stay in touch with that group of people because that was the core group of people that I experienced Armenia with for the first time. Um, and Armenia was a very new place to us at the time. And and so that bonding during that, that process was fantastic. Um, I'm obviously the only one who has stayed, not obviously, but I am the only one who has stayed stayed in Armenia. Um, after we all finished our volunteering, there were about five of us who were living in Armenia. Um, I was the only one in Volanzor, but the other four were in, um, in Yerevan. And so now it's amazing to to be able to reminisce about those days. And even though I'm the only one left in Volanzor, like, it's, it's so nice to get them caught up on kind of all of the friends that we had here. And um, so I'll be eternally grateful for that early time and that kind of birthright Armenia group that brought me here because I think that my experience in getting to know Armenia would have been extremely different if I didn't do birthright Armenia and potentially wouldn't have been as positive because through the birthright program, I really assimilated so smoothly and easily into kind of, um, you know, my local group of friends now. And, uh, and there's no place I'd rather be. So it all worked out. It really, really all worked out. Um, let's see. So it's already 45 minutes that I've been rambling on. I don't know how how much of this was. Well, I, I definitely hope that some of this was useful or helpful or interesting. Um, I'll, I'll wrap up slowly. So if you want to learn um, any more information about my work and kind of the things that I'm doing here while living in Volodzor, um, you can go to my websites. So the first website is of the company Creopia Productions. So that's creopiaproductions.com. And and the second website is my personal website, which is just my last name, avanyan.com. Um, and on there, you see kind of all updates around my work, um, most interestingly, what Creopia is doing. And so also, I just want to say that if um, if anybody ever ends up in Volantor, if it's not already obvious, I am extremely passionate about the city. And if you ever want to grab a coffee, if you're driving through here, um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm always happy to brag and talk about how fantastic this city is. Um, and yeah, okay, so Zovog is asking, what is my work from home routine? Has anything changed since the quarantine? So um, my first week of quarantine, which was last week, really, really started out uh, on a rough note. I was really bummed because of all of the very exciting things that I had planned for the, for the next coming weeks. Um, I was really bummed that I couldn't continue training in person. And, um, you know, I was just feeling like the personal impact of not having access to my friends and my social support circle. So my first week went by in a blur because I was kind of in, a, in and out of like very you know, anxious and depressive states because of all of this COVID stuff. And I, the first two days that I was in quarantine, I was completely sucked into the, you know, media trap, the, the black hole, which is COVID videos, like theories, speculations about like what's happening and all that jazz. So that was last week. <laughs> um, every day I was like slowly reorienting myself towards building a routine and getting back on track. Um, so thankfully my business, because uh, my work is already location independent, so the the majority chunk of of work and kind of revenue that i generate is uh comes from video editing from graphic design and from animation um so all of that work is done remotely so actually i haven't um my business hasn't struggled because these are all projects that are ongoing i there there are some projects that have been postponed but another thing that i'm noticing with a lot of my clientele is that uh because of the coronavirus and people being stuck inside um there are a lot of people who are going through their video archives and like organizing their computers and they reach out to me as a video editor because they, they have footage that they need edited. So actually the Corona time has been, um, I wouldn't say it has like completely improved like my business prospects, but uh, I definitely haven't suffered. So, so that's something that I'm very, very grateful for. So I am able to, to kind of maintain the same um, quantity of work that I, that I have been doing for these last few months. Um, and uh, also we are able to, to, to be training people still at the same time. So very grateful for technology <laughs> and the fact that um, I, I am one of the lucky ones who was already working in a sphere um, of, you know, profit generation that is location independent. So, so I haven't suffered significantly, but I 
feel like I have personally suffered because the things that give me the most energy in my Creopia work is the events, the film screenings that we hold and the trainings that we do, because that is when we have the contact, um, you know, with uh, with youth in Bonazor. Um, so, so in that sense, Creopia has really suffered in that I feel like our impact hasn't been as active and won't be, I guess, for the next few weeks. But um, but in terms of of working at home and and all of our other clients that have been going, that has, has not needed to change. Um, I've tried to really, really stick with um, a morning routine, um, but it's not very successful. I, I can't honestly say that I've done anything consistently in the mornings. What I have been consistent with is my habits. So I'm, I'm doing my habits pretty consistently. I keep track of them all here. You can see this is a habit tracker. So here since the corona virus started you can see that i've been doing a lot more of my daily habits so but that i don't count that as a routine because um because i do them at random times of the day and just whenever i feel like it basically whenever i get tired of working i'll go to my habits list and i'll i'll choose a habit to do to 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 distract me uh, so Bella is asking me if I work with VTC and yes, uh, VTC has been a huge supporter of ours. So when we started, oof, what was that in December? Um, they have a, they have a program where they lend a uh, space to new businesses in Valladolid for three months. So we were using their space, um, for three months as our office space, which was fantastic. And the team at VTC, um, I have most contact with Pat Bakan and Anna. They're both fantastic. And uh, the training course that we do um, on video editing, that was using that same space um, in VTC where they have computers um, with Premiere Pro on all of them. Um, so VTC and uh, the engineering, oh, I forget what it's called, but VTC and their partner, um, they're the ones who supported us with that training. Um, so we're very excited to get back into the VTC space and, and keep using it, but, but that's all on hold right now. So, um, yeah, I'm really glad that VTC exists in uh, in Valladolid. I really wish that there was more activity and action happening, of course. But if you've ever, I'm sure you've seen it, Bella. Um, for any of you, uh, for any of you who haven't been to Valladolid, if you ever make it here, try to visit VTC because it's a it's just a cool architectural building. It has this yellow wall and spiral staircase, and it's really fun to to spend a day there. And you can get a tour no problem. Um, so yeah, so VTC is definitely something that I hope that in the future will become a, a lot more active and kind of engaging with the. Uh, with the population and hopefully with Creopia's work there and bringing in a little bit of a creative splash, um, you know, that'll, that'll do that for sure. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, you can also see that uh, one of my new year's resolution this year that I chose in January was to learn guitar. And so also during this coronavirus thing, um, I have been practicing significantly more. And I've been playing very um, Corona themed uh, songs. <laughs> well, not directly, obviously, but um, one of the songs that I've been practicing, which is an easy guitar beginner song, by the way, if you are by chance also learning guitar. Um, None of Us Are Free, which is a song that would have became popular um, by Ray Charles, but it was written by Solomon Burke. Um, the whole song uh, is about how we're also interconnected. And I don't know, I started listening to the song again when the Corona epidemic uh, started happening. And, and it's a song that was written decades ago, but the lyrics ring so true. It's a very, very timeless song. The lyrics ring so true today and kind of what's happening right now. So so yeah, that's been a guitar song. Okay, Dima John, she's asking, do you know about distance learning in Valenzo? Well, do you know what's the situation there? Yeah, so all of the um, universities ha and schools have gone on to distance learning. Uh, I know that for the schools, they're not, especially for the younger grades, they're not doing the Zoom lessons, but they they give um, the homework lessons for the parents to do with them um, at home. Thank you very much, Robert John. Very very nice having you. Um, and then I know that the universities here in Bonanzo, they have moved on to, um, to Zoom calls. Um, but, but everybody's graduations that are supposed to be coming up pretty soon um, are all going to be done virtually on Zoom. Um, so, so that's pretty sad. But, but I do know that all the educational institutions, they haven't like suspended um, classes or whatever. They, they are still ongoing. Um, so that's what's happening now. Whoops. There we go. 
Yeah, so let's see, guys. I don't want to take up too much more of your time. So I'll say thank you very, very much for um, spending this hour with me uh, on this lovely Saturday. Hopefully, you guys are all staying safe, um, staying clean, and staying isolated to keep everybody else around you safe. And I hope that even in this time of what feels like extreme disconnect and that's definitely what it feels like to me we can still find connection in new ways in online Ooh, another question do you think you can find other spaces in the world i mean you can find other spaces. Uh, okay so um in terms of finding other spaces uh there there are other spaces and there are other organizations that that we're collaborating with um we actually had a training that was set to start um Oh, oh no, next week. It was set to start at the beginning, beginning of April, um, a collaboration with an NGO here, and we were going to be using their space and um, their um, resources uh, to be doing that training um, because it was run. Uh, it was also a project for one of the Peace Corps volunteers. But since the Corona pandemics happened, all Peace Corps volunteers have been called back home and evacuated. Um, so that project is is completely suspended but um there are definitely other partners here in Valenzo that are also very active and, and very very good friends of Creopia um with whom we'll work um VTC is not in the center of the city but there are a lot of um kids who go there because of the other courses that they provide mostly programming um so so that's the reason that BTC works out really well. And it's not very difficult to get um, from the center to, to BTC or from another neighborhood. Um, another question. OK, so how do we reach the kids for the trainings? So last year when we started doing trainings, um, we only had two computers. Uh, so we only had two students. <laughs> um, and those were just two students that we knew from our social circle. Um, Lucina, my partner, she's uh, a local volunteer and she's been working uh, in the region for the last eight years, mostly in peace building and um, uh, like anti-war kind of work with a lot of NGOs here. So through all of that outreach that she's done over the last eight years, um, her network here in Bonazor and all throughout Armenia and well, the Caucasus region actually um, has been has been very extensive. And so uh, a lot of our outreach um, happens through through Busina's network. And then for the VTC training, um, the call was also put out um, in in all the VTC networks. And so a lot of our students are also. Um, kind of came came to us via VTC. Um, so yeah, so there are a few different kind of outsources that we have. What we haven't started doing yet is um, collaborating directly with the schools or universities. Um, because we just haven't had the capacity yet. I mean, Creopia's team, I mean, right now it's it's still pretty early days because it's only myself and my partner who are working full time. Um, and then we have a volunteer who also supports us part time. But, um, you know, I would want I would want Creopia to be a lot stronger as a business. Um, and yeah, we would obviously love to have our own space in Valadol, um, you know, in the near future, which is which is going to be feasible quite soon. Um, so so yeah so that's definitely something that will also shift our operations because as soon as we have our own space to operate in um we won't really be bouncing around uh from locations because right now also every time we do a film screening event um part of the the purpose of the film screening events is also kind of bringing energy back into the old volador theater so we would rent out the old soviet theater which is a very like funky wooden you know wall with all of the old seats um you know left over from from 30 40 years ago um and so part of the idea of having you know events done in the spaces was basically re-energizing and revitalizing the spaces um you know with new uh creative energy um but it would be great to have our own space to, to be able to do that and and not have to bounce around we also did one of the events at my house um when we had a few less people because the movie theater was too cold and we couldn't heat it um so there are definitely a lot of kind of factors that come up very unexpectedly um but yeah so that's kind of how our outreach and space um question goes on Thank you so much for all your questions, Bella. I really, really appreciate it. I, I would love to connect. So, so um, you know, find me after this. Um, and I just want to say thank you again for taking the time to listen. I hope you have a, you know, uh, <laughs> energetic day because I know it's hard to keep um, 
you know, energy high during this time when we don't really have our normal forms of contact. And yeah, stay posted for, for things that are happening in Valladolid and Creopia. And keep in mind that this is a very, very special place. And if you ever have the chance to come, I recommend. I have been Sashka. It's been a pleasure. And I hope you guys have a great Saturday. Stay tuned.